basically a battlefield walk, uh, except the only difference is I'm uh, flying. And because it was an aerial combat that happened, um, we're, I, I decided to um, to actually fly, to rent an airplane and fly the route there where the Red Baron was actually shot down. So um, do you see this, this slide here now? History is not complete until we know all of the history. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. That's been become a bit of a mantra of mine. I, I really, I've read uh, some books by David Olusoga, and I think they're absolutely terrific. And he makes a point that uh, we have limited views of, of, um, of history and certain events. And um, it's, it's, there's a lot going on. And that's the beauty of it. So um, I, I like to kind of fill in some details. I'd like to sort of see the uh, see it from uh, from a perspective that I'm used to. So I was mentioning this picture here, which I found on uh, the history blog, and it's it's basically an uh, an archaeological from an archaeological dig that was done about uh, the, of of a grave site that was um, about three thousand years old, and this young woman uh, put the bracelets on. And I love this kind of thing because it, it comes a lot, it makes it, the history come alive. And there's now this, this, this you're, you're in touch with, with people from, from 3000 years ago. And this is the sort of thing that gets me excited about history is when we can actually reach back and, and make it come alive. And it's something that I've endeavored to do. Uh, I consider myself a historian, but I consider myself an amateur historian. And, and so my procedures aren't, aren't, are hardly scientific. But, you know, I enjoy it. I love looking into detail. It just makes things more realistic for me. So this is what this is about. Um, it's about Manfred von Richthofen. And I, I'm sure you all know about him. He's the leading ace of World War I. And um, it's, it's been a, um, uh, he's just a, a figure of fascination. And the question is always, uh, why is Manfred von Richthofen so interesting? And the thing that I think draws, certainly drew me in as a kid, to uh, the studying about the aces is is simply because they're cool, you know they they're they're heroes. You know, for me he, it was Bruce Lee. He was a cool guy, and for me uh, Manfred von Richthofen was a cool guy. So that drew me in in the in the, in the initial uh, my interest initial interest as a child. But of course, as you grow older, you get more and more of, of a of a understanding of the history, and it's it's been a you know, why is it that we're so interested in this guy, this one guy, you know, we, they, 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 people study, write books about this one guy, and yet millions of people died in the war, and um, nobody gave them the credit, nobody's figured out exactly how it is that they died, and they haven't done measure, uh, laser measurements and reenactments of, of, of these people, and it's, um, it's tragic, but it is a, uh, um, it, it's just, I don't know, just the way we're built, I guess. We're fascinated with these, with these heroes and, and want to dig into it. So I, I like to uh, dig into the detail. I'm fascinated with all these aces. Um, but, you know, I've grown my understanding of, of what the implications are uh, about the war and, and, and the sacrifices that so many people have made. So it, it's, I can't tell you, I can put this all into a um, I, I have a complete understanding. I'm far from that, but I, uh, you know, we, I'm still interested in the aces, but I am interested in the overall picture, and I am interested in hearing about the, the stories of the individual people. So, just a little bit about myself. Um, as I say, I've been doing this since since um, I've been in grade three. I've been interested in in airplanes. I've become a glider pilot. I started that when I was about 17 years old. And I basically grew up on an airfield. So my perspective is from the air. Uh, I build models. Um, that's something which is a hobby, which I've been doing all my life. And it's just been a great, um, a great thing for me. So um, uh, I, the other thing that a book that I had read called Knights of the Air, it started my interest in, in, in aviation, in World War I aviation specifically. But it also was illustrated by a wonderful artist. Um, and um, I actually met him later on. Sorry, I beg your pardon. It's, I'm drawing a blank uh, senior's moment here. Um, but he was um, instrumental. Uh, that book was instrumental in getting me going as a designer. So I have a design firm. I'm a concept artist. And you can see uh, one sample of the work I've done. So it, this one book, 
in grade three triggered my interest in aviation. It, it triggered my interest in, in, in design and illustration. So, and that's what I do today. I have a company that specializes in design of theme parks and um, water parks and that sort of thing. So I've also become a member of the Great War Flying Museum. And down in the right hand corner is a, a photograph that I took two days ago, went up in the uh, saw with one and a half strutter that they have at the museum. And it was uh, uh, a replica SC5, three quarter size was flying formation. So I was in the back seat. So this is my first time I've actually had an experience of, of being in a World War I airplane. And boy, it was an eye opener. I thought I, I knew everything, you know, but being a pilot and having read a zillion books, but boy, that experience of being inside that airplane um, was unbelievable. I, I put my hand up into the, into the slipstream. I was strapped into the back seat looking backwards, but I stuck my hand up into the, into the slipstream. I couldn't hold it out there. So the idea of what these guys went through was, was unbelievable. I, um, it was good to experience it. The, the noise, the vibration, um, this, this SE5 was weaving from left to right and going under the tail. And I thought, my gosh, if I had a, a machine gun, I don't know, I, I think I'd be Fokker fodder pretty quick. Um, so anyways, it was a great experience. The Great War Fly Museum gives flights. You can book a flight, you can go up, um, cost about 200 bucks, but you can go up and see what it's like um, uh, firsthand. So I'm going to just, um, talk a little bit about my, um, my perception of, of this, this battle, this fight um, from my perspective as a pilot. And um, this is a, a shot that was taken, I guess it's, it's around the morning time when, when actually when the, the actual, the, 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 the fight actually happened around 10, 10.30 in the morning. And this is a morning shot of the Somme Valley. I didn't take this one, I found this one online. But um, this is kind of what you see, you know, and it's, it's um, from up there, it's misty. You know, you're, you're, you're really looking at, for the most part, the sky. The ground is misty. It's a long way down. And also the thing that happens in the air, as all, all of you have seen, if you looked out the window when you're taking a flight, is that the ground becomes flat. And the Somme Valley is actually, um, it's not that deep, but it's deep enough. You know, they were... The, the air fight went right down on the deck. You know, they were flying along the river and the, the sides of the, of the, the ridge, that, which, is, which was to the right, it's quite high, you know, relatively, especially when you're down low. But up high, you're, the ground flattens out and you really don't see the, that. Now, Von Richthofen was no rookie. He had actually done a lot of ground, ground strafe, um, strafing. So he, he knows what it's like to go down, from high up to down low. And what that experience is like but for most of the part uh, most of a flight this is what you're seeing the world you're detached from the world and so yes there is archie and you know there are there were anti-aircraft explosions but the ground is way way down there and your your real threat is up high so i, I need to emphasize that because to understand that you know we have all sorts of words and written about you know how the gunners were firing at him how brown was firing at him um, but it's good to see what he was actually seeing himself. And it was, it was not unlike this. So the ground was way down there. Also as a glider pilot, um, I've had some fabulous experiences. The, what is important to me as a pilot, as a glider pilot, is, the, um, is what's in the air with you. And I'm looking for, uh, looking at the clouds, I'm looking at probably sur you know, sources for possible thermals, I'm looking at my instruments, but I've been in gaggles of, of, um, of gliders before, 12, 14 gliders, and they're all jockeying around trying to get the best position for, uh, for the thermal. So the, the right-hand picture, uh, this is common. You, you're, I'm watching the guy in front of me. Um, in this case, this picture was taken from a third person who's actually behind these two. So the, you can actually see them go up and down in the thermal, and you're trying to keep position. One thing that's different about the, being flying a glider in a gaggle like this is that nobody's trying to kill you. So the, um, but still, this is these are threats to me, but they're also indicators. So indicators of of who's going up, who's going up, and who's going down. Where the where the thermal is, 
but there's still threats. I don't want to have a mid-air collision. So I want to be, I'm very, very aware of this. I'm not paying attention to the ground at all. I'm looking at these other aircraft that are circling around with me. And it's funny too, when, when you're in a thermal and you're strapped in and you're, you're climbing, you want to climb, climb the other guy. You want to find the lift and, and get higher faster than everybody else. So it triggers the, the competitive urge uh, in you. And I can imagine, I, well, I can just imagine what it wants to be like in a dog fight where you want to get that behind that other guy. And um, so this, this, these are young men who are flying here. So, and this sense of you want to survive, you don't want somebody, you don't want to fly into anybody or have somebody fly into you. But on the other hand, you're, you're, you're competing uh, very aggressively. So when, when you're in a thermal like this, or when you come out, it's, it's exhilarating and you're really keyed up. And when you get out, you go, phew, wow, glad that's over. But it's, it's a real thrill. So I can only take that experience uh, with me about what it must be like. And I, this is important because it, it sort of sets the stage. So two things, you know, I think that, that you're up high, that von Richthofen and the fight that he was in, they're up high, not being at that much attention to the ground. Um, you're also looking at the threats at all around you. And these are your own people and the, and the people who are trying to kill you and then the people who he wanted to kill. So um, it's a different kind of thing that, that he was looking for. The people say, well, why did he do what he did? Why did he break his rules and, and drop down? Well, the, it, it's a different perspective. It's, yeah, it was a dumb thing to do and it got him killed. Um, he went down low, he broke his rule. He went down low and chased somebody behind the lines. But um, but you know, you you have a different perspective than what you have in the ground on the ground, and I want to emphasize that. So um, there is, as I say, there's certain things that were similar uh, that I that I have as a pilot, but uh, but as a civil pilot, I'm fortunate that I don't have have the thing where people are trying to kill me. So um, <laughs> this is a bit of a silly map, but this is kind of basically where 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 I went. Uh, on the left hand side is Amiens. And there's the Somme River, which is very, very distinctive. So um, the feature through there. And again, like when you're up high, you see, yes, they would have seen the scar of the, of the front lines going through, but there's a lot of farm, farmland and it's very beautiful. And you see the sky. So it's a different perspective than what you'd have on the ground. This is um, a close-up map. I think, I believe it's a, a map that was done fairly, maybe, you know, after the war. But it shows on the left-hand side, Amiens, here's the Somme River, which really isn't a river. It's really a series of marshes that, that runs through. And um, uh, through here is the, the front lines. And they were actually running right through a little town called sally le -Sec, um, at that per period of time. Uh, this is not a great, uh, sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy. But this is a contour map. And it shows the Somme Valley at this point. Here's the... Amiens over here, the river kind of runs through. And um, there's a series of, of, of this is one big ridge here, but there's a series of cutaways as well. The front lines ran, I, I believe it was right through here, this black line. Um, and this is the high ground. Um, so there's Sally Lissac there. And so you can see that there's, I guess these are one meter increments here. Um, the Australian uh, gunners, uh, field artillery, there was a bunch of them stationed here behind the ridge and they were firing over top of uh, the ridge. So if you were on the German side, you couldn't see these, these batteries that were hidden here. And, um, and so the, the Australians were largely within this, this area here. And again, forgive me, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a historian of, of any sort. There's people with a lot of knowledge about what was actually going on the ground. So I'm, I'm beginning to get that now. But the front lines, here's the Amiens, here's Sally Lissac, and the front lines that, ha that, were, that were in April of 1918 was this green line. And these other lines, the gold one, the green one, the pink line, they show the, the offensive, which happened in 1918. But the green line is where, um, where it was on that particular day. The, again, another sort of Google map um, it's a great vacation. I, I hope you, I'm sure many of you actually visited this, this site. There is a ton of stuff to see. 
and um, you know the Australian memorials, and you can see some of these. There's not a lot to see around this uh, around the the areas of interest for me is for the Red Baron, but um, certainly there's tons of stuff to see in the area. Um, so this is um, gives you a bit of an, uh, an idea of, of where we're talking, but we've zoomed in here. Uh, I've got a number of maps to show you, or I, I, to show, but here's essentially the essential parts that I'm interested in it for his, um, his last flight. The front line was running approximately here through Sally Lissac on that, on that day. Von Richthofen took off from an airfield here at a place called Cappy, and then flew here, big dogfight around Sally Lissac, Sally Lorette, Lorette, there was a big swirling dogfight, and then he crashed here. It, another thing that I want to emphasize is that this, my flight that I took, it was over like in an instant. From my calculations, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's about 13 kilometers, eight miles from where he took off, flew along the Somme uh, River, with his with his squadron, and that take, takes about six minutes. And then there was a dogfight, which I don't know how long that lasted. Let's say ten minutes. And then the the actual combat itself was no more than fifteen minutes long. So within a half an hour, this whole thing happened. It was over in an instant. And there's a wonderful um, um, a piece on on uh, if you can get Netflix. There's Discovery Channel had done a. Uh, a show where they use lasers and they they did a time study and all that. It's a, it's a great one to watch. I, I checked it out again last night. So um, definitely worth watching. The important other important thing that we need to know is that the prevailing winds were coming from east to west. Usually they come from west to east or from the northwest. To, on that day, they were coming from the east. And so the distance, the time that he took to fly from his home uh, airfield in Cappy to this battle area, it was, you're blown with the wind. You're like a fish in, a, in an aquarium. If you pick that aquarium up, you're gonna move with it. So uh, a pilot always has to be aware of, of drift and how the wind is actually carrying you along. So this, he's, I'm, I'm sure very, very aware of it. But again, uh, they said that he was maybe focused on, on the dogfight and chased uh, May across the, the enemy lines, usually the Germans didn't cross that much. They stayed on their side of the lines and the allies had to go in, go after them. But he, he, he made the mistake of going, crossing the lines. And of course the wind was drifting as well. So your ground speed um, was increased, um, not by about it wasn't high winds, but still it was enough that uh, you have to watch your drift. And if you're concentrating on dogfight, you're not concentrating that much on your drift. And also I wanna emphasize like it was misty, you know, that shot that I, I'd shown you, you know, that's um, you, you, it's not easy to really pick out ground features. So it, it's, I think it would be easy for him to, uh, to cross over the lines and not being fully aware of it. Um, you can dispute that um, and you're probably right, but I think that that's, it's a factor. So this is, this is roughly, I did this um, from a composite from a number of studies. Um, that this is the path that, oh, sorry, I just want to go back one. Um, Roy Brown and his squadron came from, uh, from up here, northwest of here. They flew down, had the big dogfight, and then, and then away they went. So, and then, of course, there were Australians' positions were all along the ridge. So this is approximately, you know, my idea of what happened. Von Richthofen and his crew came, came from this side. Uh, uh, me and Brian actually had come up from, from the south. I guess they'd been swirling around, but uh, the dogfight happened over at Sally Lissac, and then the chase happened. So von Richthofen chased uh, May um, along the, the valley, and then he, he, I think they came up to the ridge, and they pulled up, sorry, May is the yellow line here. So they, they chased at low level, and then went popped up and over the ridge. Um, I think the, I don't have this quite right. I just have, it came around and crashed. But he actually, there was a bit of a fish hook. He came down and then crashed back the other way. So he did a bit of an S curve from what we understand. So again, there was back here, this is the back side of the ridge. This is where there was anti-aircraft guys. So Bowie uh, and Evans were back here um, with anti-aircraft guns. I think they had post-mounted Lewis guns. 
Popkin was here with a with a um, uh, with a Vickers gun. So um, Popkin had a pop at him as he was coming here, but probably missed because if they examined his his body and they found that the bullet had come from lower right and exited upper left, which makes it difficult to believe that the shot was actually from Brown in the air. It's more likely that it was actually uh, came from the ground, uh, sorry to say. Um, that seems to be the, the overwhelming evidence that I can see. So uh, Popkin didn't get him on this point, but when he did come back, he had a chance to get him from, he came around and got him from, uh, from right and below. The other one who could have, who, who was likely to have gotten was Evans because he was flying away from him and he was in the right position. So he, he came around and crashed in this area here and um, it was very close to a, a, a building, a, a set of buildings called the Brickworks. So my flight was actually down the river valley and um, to follow this route. So, um, and you can see even from this, that it's really the, it's not, a, it's not what you call like a river. It's, it's more like, it's very low, very, very, very marshy, um, ponds everywhere. And uh, they actually had to cut uh, a canal through here uh, in order for boats to go through. So the boats don't actually go on the river, they go on the canal. So the, um, and if you go in to do some research, there's all sorts of diagrams of positions and things like that. And I'm really not going to get into that right now because, um, you know, it's been covered. You know, there's, there's been, there's tons of books about it, tons of documentaries about it. So, you know, look into it. Um, and there's, and there's some things which are even contradictory. Like this is a map that done by somebody who was, I think, supposedly there or soon after. And, you know, they didn't fly that straight. You know, it's, I think you got to just kind of poke through and see what the information is and kind of draw your own conclusions. But I am of the conclusion that, that, um, that the shot was from the ground um, that got him. And I may be wrong, but, you know, you look at when Brown shot at him around here and then he flew on chasing um chasing may further so if brown had gotten the, the kill shot here it was it was a massive wound and yeah boy he would have been entering this death very quickly but he didn't you know he kept going so if anything brown took a shot at him and then made him aware of what was happening but he still continued to chase and then one of these brown gunners i think got him is everybody reeling from that I'm sorry if, if you are. Um, so again, go online, tons of information about this. So this is a shot which is taken uh, from the Australian lines and it's dropping down to the right into, into the, Somme, the Somme Valley. And you can see that when they call what they call a ridge isn't what we think of a ridge. You know, you gotta, you know, like Saving Private Ryan, you gotta go up this cliff side. It's the, the ridges are very, very gentle, uh, very, 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 very low. But still, you can see that you know a machine gunner up on up on the high ground can certainly fire down and see the enemy down below. So this is a, a case where the Australian positions are are dug in on one of the, the slopes that are going down there. And you, oh, what's also interesting is that back then I don't see any trees here. This is pretty, and I don't think they've been bombarded. I think they just simply cut them all down. Now it's 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 grown over and there's trees everywhere. So. Um, uh, so it doesn't look like it did look looked like back then. So that's one thing you've got to use your imagine your imagination. This is, uh, I believe, um, 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 Sally Lasek uh, nestled into one of the little ridges in there. I believe I might have that wrong though. Um, this is a view which is taken back. Um, this is actually what's called Moreland Court Ridge. So we're looking more or less uh, northeast here. So the flight would have come along behind that dark line of trees and then up and over the ridge. If you look closely, you can actually see the, the smokestack from the, from the, um, of the brickworks. So this is kind of looking back. Um, this is another view of Moreland Court Ridge and back behind here is the brickwork. So they actually flew from right to left, climbed up and over this ridge and then came under fire from the Australians on the backside of the ridge and then crashed back here. What's interesting is that a lot of these features are still are still there today and you can see them. Um, 
there's another closer shot of, of Moreland Court Ridge. So this building is a postcard and I believe it's, wait a minute, sorry. Remember this right here. So we're back here and then this is what it looks like today. So these features here are, are still there and it's kind of neat. And you can see the, the, the coverage of it is, is different, but nothing much has really changed that much. Here's a shot at, um, that I uh, take found, and this is the Australian positions. This is the psalm. Here's the canal. Can everybody, hopefully everybody can see that okay. There's the canal. The front lines, I've roughly put them in here. So that's Sally Lissac nestled back in here. Now, obviously the Germans aren't gonna advance along here unless they got a bunch of boats. So the, 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 the trench is pretty well end at this point where the, where the land drops off. But this is the kind of view that uh, the Australians who were firing at them would have had. And I go to Google Earth, there's Sally Lissac, there's the canal. And I see this little wiggle right here. I think that's little, this little wiggle right here. So it's very marshy through here. And this photograph, I believe, was taken right about in here somewhere. So that dogfight, that chase that von Richter was, was he came, they came right past here, must come right past these positions at low level. You can see that, that um, you're still looking down, um, but that's about where I think it actually happened. Here's another view from Google Earth. This is what it looks like today. This is uh, that Australian position, which is pretty close. Here it is from almost ground level on Google Earth. And, and the features match up pretty well, if you ask me. Here's the, the, the edge of the Somme River and here the, the little wiggle in it. And that little wiggle is still there. That little island that's there, well, there it is there. There's the canal, there's the canal. Um, there's the slope, there's the slope. There's Sally Lasek. So there you go. I think it's it's kind of it's all there. You know, you can probably walk right to this very spot. Um, I, I think Glenn would get gas for that kind of experience of seeing what it was like. Much more heavily treated today uh, than it was back then, and obviously it was in the spring as well. So um, so the leaves haven't, weren't quite coming back. So let's get on to my my flight. Um, I know where I wanted to go. There's an airport right here um, in Amiens. And it's an old airfield. I think it was, it may have been there during the war. It was certainly there during World War II. The, um, I was asking what, you know, what happened with the Germans here? And yes, they were, they had, they had some Luftwaffe aircraft based there. So I was, I had a choice of either this airport here or this airport here. So I chose this one for no particular reason, just because it was basically easy to get to. And I got there and I don't speak, I hardly speak a word of French. So I just took it in, in high school. And, uh, but I'm funny, I managed to make myself understood. And, um, and they say, oh, they knew what I, what I wanted because I think other people have shown up for this very same thing. So basically we're gonna fly from this airport and then fly over to um, this area here and then come back along, um, along the Somme and then circle around the crash site, which is roughly here. The brickworks are, are in here. So I wanted to see that was like, see how long it took, that sort of thing. So here we go, we're gonna um, start the flight. And um, if, you, if you see that documentary by Discovery, uh, it's, on, it's on YouTube actually, you'll see that this is the airport they took off from to do the, these, these studies for lasers. The very airplane that's in the documentary, I flew that type, or sorry, I think I was, I flew in. Um, so they have, uh, it's a glider club that's there. So it looked very familiar with these beautiful gliders. And um, they had some warbirds there. They had a steerman. So it was pretty cool, neat, neat place. And we flew in an aircraft called a Robin and you can just see one back over here. It's a, I guess it's like a Piper Cherokee. Um, it's got fabric wings and it's got the, the outer uh, sections of the wings are, uh, have a bit of dihedral on. So it has a bit of a, a look of a stuka to it. Uh, so I flew um, with this fella and, didn't speak a word of English, but he was an aerobatic pilot. And he had a leather jacket, so I figured he knows what he's doing. So we hopped in and um, away we went. And I had with me a piece of the Red Baron's airplane. So I'd given, I was given that to a, uh, from a buddy named Larry Watson of London. And he said, you're a good guy here. He had a piece of fat, bigger piece of fabric. This was 
hanging off. So he gave me this piece. So I've reunited this, the Red Baron's airplane. Doesn't that bring tears to your eyes? So um, I thought that was kind of goofy, but it was kind of fun. And my wife, of course, um, who uh, flew with us in the back seat. She has no fear. She was, um, uh, actually, I took her off for a flight in the glider and proposed to her afterwards, once, once we get on the ground. And she said, yes. So there you go. So um, she was a good sport and we went to the back seat. So here we go. Um, now I, I, I was just banging away pictures and I didn't really think of taking them in a, in a sequence. So these might be a little bit out of sequence, um, but um, forgive me, but this will give you an idea of what, what it is we're looking at. So you notice that it looks, the picture on the right, it looks flat. Like it doesn't, you don't see any contours from up here. Um, but the, you know, you saw the picture in, of that from the Australian positions, it really is quite, um, um, you know, the valley is lower than you think. So this is a wartime picture. Here's the canal um, and the town Sal, uh, Sa uh, Sally Larat is here. And um, it's either here, I guess here or here somewhere. It's just been, it just bombed the crap out of it. So there wasn't much left. So, but basically you can see these features are still there today. This is the, the an aerial view of um, Sally Lesec, where the dog the dog fight happened right over top of here. Uh, this is a, a, a series of views of just basically flying along the canal um, towards the site. And it, you know, it, you really got to use your imagination to think this is like, this is, this is ground zero. This is the front lines. This was mud, um, but it's all grown up. It's all very lovely. You really got to use your imagination. So it's a so you can see that we're, we're, we're getting lower here. Um, the pilot was a good sport. You know, of course he was, he was a, um, you know, I was keeping an eye on, you know, we're pilots, but, you know, we were flying a little bit lower than maybe what we should have, but um, um, we certainly weren't on the deck. I think at this point, Von Richthofen and May were right down on the water and they had to sort of fly up and over things. And we were still quite high. You can see our shadow there. And we're coming towards the, the end of it where we're actually uh, coming towards uh, Moreland Court Ridge. So uh, here we've actually pulled up and over the ridge. We were actually um getting you know pretty much below the the top of the ridge and we were um we we pulled up and over the ridge now may had just barely skimmed uh the top so we were we were a few hundred feet well above the ridge so don't worry it was safe um, um relatively speaking this is actually the crash site now so we're going to start to circle around the uh the crash site he, here's the brickworks and this is where he crashed in this field. So we, uh, Von Richthofen actually flew a route very similar to this. We're going up and over the ridge to the left that you don't see in the, in the photograph is where, um, is where uh, Bui and Evans were firing at him. So he was gonna, he flew around and circled and crashed or came back and then crashed here. So right now we'd be probably be pretty close to um, the firing zone of, of uh, Frederick Popkin who was down to our right. So here's some shots as we're starting to circle the site. And you can see the Bray uh, Corby Road. Here's the brickworks. And this is a field that he crashed in. So this approximately would, would be heading right towards Bui, uh, sorry, um, uh, Bui and Evans, who would be firing at him. And this is pretty well the position you know, where he would be in as he passed over those two gunners and was hit and then would have come back flown around here and then crashed here. So we flew over the brickworks and circled around um, just to get a feeling for it. And it was pretty well in this field right here that the aircraft came down. So we would have come from upper right, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, maybe from the left and then crashed into here. There was a bit of a mound in the field somewhere, but that's the crash site right there. Uh, and then once we got down, we um, I, I drove back to the, the actual site and these are the brickworks and this is the field that, that which he was found in. And they had the, um, a memorial, small memorial there. 
and um, to show exactly where the site. Not much of a memorial, but that that's what's left. The um, in town, this is a church that uh, May and Von Rachel, and they just barely made it over this thing. They they just they they skimmed over this. So this is um, in the village, which is right near the crash site. We also drove back, uh, it was kind of neat, we're driving around saying, hey, that's the church. So, um, so that church is famous. They almost hit that, that, that belfry there. Then we went, drove over to Cappy and we can see the, uh, this was his headquarters. It's, the house is empty. It'd be, I thought it'd be a great bed and breakfast, but across the street back behind us is the airfield where the air, aircraft actually um, took off from. So we did a little bit of a mini tour. And then in the area, uh, you know, we, we went up to Vimy Ridge and we also went to the um, um, Thiepville um, Memorial and the Museum of, um, uh, of the Great War, which is a terrific museum. So there's tons of tons of stuff to see if you if you if you get into the um, if you get a chance to go over there and um, tour around. So I guess that's what you know. This is all about you know. This is was just my impressions. Um, I didn't answer anything you know as far as who killed him, but I do have now a much better sense just like if you've walked the battlefield you know what the ground feels like you know what how far it is from here to there so i, I as a pilot now i have a better sense of of what happened you know in that really really short time and what what they were dealing with so so there you go that's that's the talk um you know as i mentioned a member of the great war flying museum would love to meet more people get more a stronger connection with with um with you folks in this group and because uh, I think we have a lot to share. Okay, so um, that's the end of the talk. And I'll be happy to take any questions. So. Garfield, first and foremost, thank you very much. And as um, we accept questions now, Sarge had a clever one there a second ago. I just found something in my, uh, uh... In my uh, library there. Mm -hmm. That might be the, the 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 book that you're talking about, Nights in the Air, 1958. Yes. Not sure, not sure where I found it, but yeah, great. And, and sorry, the 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 um uh the artist, his name is William Wheeler. William Wheeler, yeah. I I he just passed away recently, and and I got a chance to meet him, and he autographed mm -hmm. my book for me. But I used to love those little pictures that were in there, and I used to trace them and draw them. And uh, mm -hmm. and boy, was that inspirational for me. Yeah. Uh, Garfield, you had a piece of the plane you, you showed at one point there. Could you could you be a little clearer on that? You actually had a piece of Rick Dovin's plane with you? Yeah, there are actually little bits of um, of um, fabric uh, floating around somewhere in museums. One's actually in downtown Toronto in the uh, Royal Canadian uh, Military Institute. And, um, and you, they come up on auction occasionally, you know, pieces that might be, you know, some bigger, some smaller. So my buddy Larry, who's a fellow modeler in London, um, he, he had just bought a piece in auction. It was about four inches by four inches, three by three, whatever, and had a little piece hanging off the side. And he said, Garfield, you're a great guy here, take it. So um, I have this little treasure now um, that I, 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 you know, have. So it's- a, it's Maybe You should give it to me, Garfield. What's that? Maybe you should give it to me. I should give it to you? Okay. <laughs> um, it's just, honestly, it's just, it's the size of a, of a fingernail clipping and, um, oh. but it's a bit of history and, um, I'm actually starting the process of, of I want to get it chemically analyzed because, um, I want to find out what's the base, uh, of that paint. Cause I understand that the, um, they could have used iron oxide as a base, which would have made the red a little bit more brown. I, I, I worry about little stupid little things like that. Um, and if it was made from another base chemical, it would have been a little brighter red. So anyways, it is an opportunity I can get a chemi chemical analysis done on that paint. So there you go. What type of plane is that on the uh, slide that's on the screen right now? Uh, let's see here. This one here? Yes. Yeah. That is a Sopwith one and a half strutter. It's, oh, a, okay. it's an odd name, uh, but the one and a half comes from the W-shaped cabane struts. Here. And it was actually a very, um, one of Sopwith's first creations. Uh, it was a two seater, and uh, they've actually got a replica flying at the Great War Fly Museum. And you can get a, this is one I just flew a couple days ago, flew in, and um, boy, it was pretty neat. 
So um, yeah, it's a um, heavy, heavy airplane, big, stable, heavy airplane. And it was used for uh, reconnaissance and it was used, actually used, they fared over the back seat and they used it as a bomber. Um, they had a fighter version, which actually had the two seater. So it was, um, yeah, it was a neat airplane. Didn't last that long, you know, cause it was pretty all obsolete by 1917. But it's alive and well at our at our uh, in Brampton. Oh, great, Garfield. Did you uh, follow any of the? Um, did you like visit his initial burial site and then perhaps go mm. to Free Court after? And no. I wonder if you. No, no I didn't go to the, the Britangles, right? The Britangle Cemetery. Right. Yeah, there was yeah. just so much I can drag my wife to. I mean, you know, she was, <laughs> you know, she gets a gold medal for, you know, she's a great sport, you know, for. Um, um, great, she's a great sport. So um, she followed me around, and I didn't want to push it. <laughs> but but it was neat. You know, we went back to Cappy, you know, and saw his this mansion where he was stationed for the last flight. And we looked through the gate, and it was empty. Like I thought, wow, I'm gonna buy this place and turn it into a B and B. Any questions for uh, for our guest? No. The brilliant topic, Garfield. Um, no. Again, I'm just going to just going to show this book. This is a fun book if you're on the Western Front to uh, in the footsteps of the Red Baron. It's a lot of fun. There's so many great uh, publications. The funeral are interest. I had that book with me, Glenn, when I when I went there and actually could find exactly they said park here and it's really handy so oh, yeah. Yeah. has anybody of our crew actually of this group have they actually been there themselves the group quite a few of us have been to the site um to the crash site yeah okay and uh, glenn warner was uh, quite active he chased uh, he was in freecourt the german cemetery trying to find the um the burial site when he was moved there he's not there anymore but uh he spent some time Kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle there right yeah if, if you want to do the same flight um you can do it um they don't advertise it it was um um i i, I wrote it i don't speak french so i wasn't able to email back and forth the book so i basically showed up so um but they will do it but they don't advertise it so um uh, so you can go to that airfield and if you speak French, all the better. You can go and book the airplane yourself, but they'll, they'll, but they they'll know what you're talking about, what you want to see. So, Garfield, I was going to Dave Fuller here. I was going to mention that you were talking about how uh, fascinated you were early about the aces and and how exciting it was. I went through the same thing, and I've I've read a lot about uh, the air war as well, and. I think the reason we all know so much about it and think of them as heroes is because there was a conscious effort by the opposing sides to use the flying guys as propaganda uh, instruments. It was cleaner. It was more heroic. It wasn't uh, as grimy and gritty as the, the ground war. And they That's did a lot weird. of stuff. They did a lot of stuff to, uh, Gild the Lily with these guys. Oh, yeah. um, you know, von Richthofen was set up for easy kills a lot. Uh, and and then there's the whole controversy over Bishop and what he actually did or didn't do. And, um, you know, I believe he did all he said he did because I'm a Bishop fan. But there are those who, who question some of his claims. It was heavily laced with propaganda. And that stuff lingers. And we picked it up as kids because there were books and uh comics and movies and stuff so yeah sure yeah i mean i grew up with um the blue max and the damn busters and reach yep. for the sky and you know it's it's, it's cool like uh, i show bruce lee but I mean, that's what got me into it and it's um you know you look for role models and heroes and you know i, I had heroes like bobby bond and dave keon and you know, you're just young. You, you, that sort of gets you into that. And that's something we should remember too. You know, like um, there are um, ways of, like, you know, we are an older bunch. And um, uh, when you think we were probably all very young when we got in there, it was much more history minded generation, I think. Yep. Um, I think more certainly more air minded back then. But um, 
there are um, th these video games that they have now. Kids are, are are coming into our area of interest through video games. Yeah, um, and they know a lot of technical stuff. It's it's shocking how much they know. Well, they treat it like a a, a shooter game, and they know specs of guns and all kinds of stuff. The the first hero of my Air Force interest was this guy over my shoulder here. That's my father standing beside his Wellington trainer in uh, oh, cool. well, Wellsburn, Mountford in England. He was a tail gunner. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and our kids, you know, you know, you know the, the closest I ever got to war was this argument. I had a guy over a parking spot in a parking lot. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm lucky, you know, so kids don't have that. But still, um, don't look at it as a bad thing. You know, the, the, video, the video games and all that. It may be just as I got in there by, um, you know, thinking it was cool. Um, I guess I still have that. I was kind of thought it was cool when it was flying yesterday. Um, but um, kids are getting into it. And, you know, maybe it's up to us to try to find that way of making the connection to what we're interested in and what they're interested in. Hey, Garfield, this question, because it's great to, to study the individual um, um, and some of the, the fantastic, uh, I guess, achievements they made. I also am, am interested in uh, the, in, the use of air power as, uh, as a kind of a transformative strategy in, uh, in the, the latter days of the Great War, and whether it be from bombers or, or from an offensive weapon along trench lines and stuff like that. Do you also get into um, 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 just studying that part of the, just because it, it was a it was a mind change versus say from 1914 all the way up to 1918 in terms of how air power is used within the offensive uh, like Amiens and and all throughout the the last hundred days. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely interested in it. Um, my um, you know as I say I, I emphasize I'm a historian but an amateur capital A amateur. So when I get into something I, I read about something read about something else and kind of in the I have the kind of shotgun effect. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, in reading uh, more and more about uh, the two-seater um, crews mm -hmm. as opposed to the aces, you know, those are the those are the you know Wayne Gretzky's of their days. Um, but that um, I just read a book about uh, by um, uh, uh, Berthold, Rudolf Berthold, and he flew. Um, I have a shot of that Tauba. It's, it looks like a bird. Um, very early in the war, and he was uh, actually they were bombarding uh, the coast. You know. Uh, Towns like Dunkirk, so they had actually used, uh, discovered the, the the usefulness of aerial reconnaissance like right off, the, right out right out of the gate, and you know of course you know as the the war went on things became more systematized and and they you know they had targets and all that and um, but it, it was I, I thought it was more of a development that was later on but it was really really early on that 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 uh, um, that use for the army was. That they were used for the army. Um, so, it, it, I don't know. Does that answer your? The, the, it's it's, it's just it's more of just things? opening up to different uh, pers uh, uh, areas of study that that may be of interest to anyone on the uh, in the group. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting too that you know I read just finished a book about um, uh, some DH four um, mm -hmm. uh, pilot and it was two seater and they'd go on bombing missions and. Uh, I didn't realize there was that many bombing missions that were, you know, they do it just like in World War II. You know, they they found that they had the target, they had the you know the maps, they had to they had to time it the long distance, the whole bit. You know, like they were, uh, um, you know, they they talked about the the accuracy or inaccuracy of aerial bombardment. So the, the, they the, the problems that they had at the beginning of, of World War II, they had in World War One, and they were mm -hmm. they were you know having the same successes and the same failures and the same seems like the same failure rates in World War One that they were having in early World War Two. So it was interesting that whole period between the wars was kind of lost that, you know, they didn't learn anything about, about that whole thing. So. Uh, Benjamin, did you have a question? <clears throat> yes, I, uh, Garfield, it's Benjamin here. Hey ben. I just, you've probably seen this magazine. Uh, I picked it up at the library. Yeah, let me see where you are here. I got to find you on. Are you holding something up? It's, it, it's the Beaver magazine from a couple years ago. Okay. It has an article about the Red Baron. Okay. 
Oh, there you are up in there. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. I have that. It's a, uh, and you know, your talk today could perhaps maybe be a follow on to this article because you have the aerial flights and the plaque and that, and then people could go in and visit it. Just an idea. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, a super article and um, yeah, I encourage you to go on, uh, you know, go to YouTube and look at some of the, the videos that are on there. There's tons of, tons of research that's been done already. Like they've, they've studied this, uh, this combat to death, you know, with pictures and measurements and everything else, you know, it's, uh, but yeah, that certainly is a good one. This is the Beaver, Beaver magazine. So it's sort of a Canadian magazine, right? They've yeah. renamed it Canada's history, right? Yeah, that was a special that they put out, right? Well, no, it's just one article of many. Right. In, what's, in the, the, what's, the, um, what's the year of that uh, of that issue, Benjamin? 2018, April and May. And they have them in the libraries. Okay. But unfortunately, uh, there's, a, um, sorry. Unfortunately, there's not a great demand for them, so they're actually throwing them out. No. And that's how I got. That's how I got this one because nobody's taking them out anymore. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was just going to make a comment about the um, something that, uh, with regards to the uh, who who was credited with the victory or who should be rightfully credited with the victory, I, you meet people through chat rooms and whatnot who who insist that the Aussies uh, should be given credit for the kill. Um, and my experience is there aren't a lot of people fighting for our side of history um, in the Deep Bell Museum. There, they just opened up the the um, a new museum there and they have all the air the aces they have bishop and rick toven and, and all the french pilots german pilots and they all all the little um, placards with each pilot say they had so many victories when you get to bishops it says that he claimed so many victories which made me angry to the point that i i talked to the people at the museum about it but it just seems that everyone you talk to now has just become accepted that the aussies did it now Maybe they did. I mean, there's been it's been studied extensively, but I, I just, from my point of view, it's nice when there's someone there to fight for our perspective on, and then on the Western Front now, there's very few people there to fight for our history, and uh, you know, Villers Bretonneau, for example, was uh, uh, Aussies are, uh, paid a great um, victory there, but it's also Canada there, and uh, we're we're basically ignored there. So that's just my point that you know. Right. I, Bishop claimed the victories, but everyone else was credited with the victories. And it just bothers me that no one is sticking up for, or in the case, Roy Brown, nobody is really sticking up for Roy Brown. And uh, he's become a bit of a footnote now that this new, new examination of the, uh, of the flight, the final flight. Right, yeah. And, and uh, you know, Glenn, we, um, you know, I, 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 as you, I think you can tell, I'm, I'm swayed a little bit more to the, the argument that came from the ground. Um, oh just having looked at it it's uh but that being said you know we um you know we we can't you know you have to conclude what you want you're right about the um you know rewriting history i understand that like bishop for example they um they said he didn't do all this well a lot of the records were destroyed um because they needed the paper you know during world war ii they destroyed the 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 combat re records and they said they have all the evidence well they don't have all the evidence they haven't a lot of it's gone so, um, well, and Garfield with, with Bishop, it was also that he did some of these famous exploits by himself. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't get confirmation. I mean, that, the, the one that got him the VC, did he get a VC? Yeah. But anyway, the one that got him the notoriety was the, the solo mission over the German airfield. Well, you know, did he or didn't he? Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm a complete Bishop fan and I believe it, but you know, <laughs> Um, I, I do too, and, and they say, well, there was no German records to to uh, to to you know to verify it. But I don't know. Apparently, all of, all those records, like we're talking yeah. like 1917. So yeah. what happened? Like we had another war in between where everything, you know, we bombed the crap out of everywhere, and there's all a lot of stuff was burnt to cinder. <clears throat> so of course, there's not going to be complete records on on World War One because World War Two went through. And yeah, and they weren't they weren't fans of keeping records of a war they lost either. <laughs> but I also I also believe that um, 
you know, if Bishop doesn't have a lot of independent confirmation, then, you know, it's his word. And, uh, you know, do you believe everything he said or, um, you, you know, do you rely on independent confirmation? And I think that's the big thing with uh, a lot of the aces is that they, they do have, um, you know, other pilots confirming their, their, uh, their kills. Where with Bishop, there's a lot that wasn't because he, he was by himself so much of the time. Well, you know, again, just my perspective as a pilot, you know, that, um, um, well, well, two things. First of all, there was a lot of overclaiming by both sides. You can be in a swirling dogfight and you take a good shot at somebody, but then somebody else takes a good shot at the same airplane and you're accurate, you know, so um, there are many multiple claims on things. So the other thing is when you're way up high and I, I fly in, in a zone of about, you know, from 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet, you know, max, you know, in there, that's typical Southern Ontario kind of cloud base for soaring. Um, but they're up at like 12, 15, 20,000 feet. And if you watch, if you look down, you can't, you can hardly see houses. You certainly can't. If you were to watch an airplane go down all that way, you're going to be dead. I mean, you can't watch it. You can't even see an airplane when it hits the ground from high altitude. So you know, confirmation, great, you know, you can take them all with, with a grain of, you know, with a bit of skepticism. And I think it's also a case of, you know, if I wound the aircraft and you kill the aircraft, who's responsible? Who gets the, the credit? Yeah, yeah. You know, because I, you were in a position to finish them off, but I started. So, yeah. you know, how do you argue with that? There's that famous the scene in the Battle of Britain movie where a pilot comes in all excited and says he got the Jerry... He says, right, lad, a third of a kill. You're the third one to say they got him. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the, the other problem, too, with confirmation, it's the same thing with snipers during the war. If you're operating alone and you snipe somebody, who's going to do confirmation? And flying an airplane in the World War I is very much like that. It's a singular event, a personal event. And who's going to be there to make that confirmation? It's a really... a, a a problem that can't be overcome. Yeah, and it's it's. You know, I think that it shows the um, the problem with hero worship. You know, when we when we really get into these aces, um, great, fascinating stuff. But you can't be. You know, that's that's not the entire history. It's only part of the history. And there was a lot, a lot of shots fired by people who pilots who weren't aces, and you know that's why I don't get too. Um, I don't get too upset about, you know, the, the Australian claims of having shot down Von Richthofen because, well, you know, like it's, it's likely and you know, there was a lot of, there were a lot of bullets fired in the air that day from the ground, for a lot more than from the air. And um, so, you know, we just don't hear about those stories of the real people that were involved. You know, we hear all the attention is on the aces, you know, and, um, you know, it's, we got to, you know, as you know, that first thing, you know, you got to look at all the history, that, that expression from that I had at the beginning, you know, the history is not complete, you know, all of the history. So, you know, there's a lot of stories of smaller people, common people, common pilots who, who did things, and you just don't hear about that much. The other thing I think about uh, Garfield is the whole point of aircraft was to aid the artillery. Artillery ruled the war. It was the, it was the single most decisive factor in in the war and the planes were there to support the artillery well then you had to shoot down these planes supporting artillery that's why fighters were created but right. if that's their main mission how do they wind up fighting each other so much and what was the point of that um it was you know it's sort of getting off the uh, the point of flying <laughs> but i guess you had to it was a control a, a fight for air supremacy which yeah, it w yeah, it was. I mean, if, if you can, if I shoot down a German fighter, that German fighter isn't going to shoot down one of our two seaters. So hence, every, you know, you had to, you know, had to be fighters. They were a threat to the artillery. So you had to sort of neutralize that threat. Yeah. But the, I mean, the way the propaganda worked is that they made these guys out to be knights of the air jousting and, uh, you know, glorious combat and all that and no they had a job to do 
yeah. and this this was just uh, a thing they had to do to get through to do their job. So it's was, it was kind of a that could, part of it's lost in the, all of the hero worship. Yeah, for sure. And boy, I'd encourage you to go to the Great War Flying Museum and take a flight in the sop with one and a half strutter in the back seat. And you're gonna like when I I go okay, I'm an old geezer. I'm not I was not 18 years old, but when I got down, it was like wow, okay, mm -hmm. let me sit down and have a cup of tea here. Well, those guys would, and I was up for about half an hour. And I was just sitting there, kind of like taking pictures with my cell phone. Those guys were up and they were like looking around and standing up in this airstream, which was really, really powerful. And that, when that, when you get the prop wash hitting you in an open cockpit airplane, uh, man, it's murder. So, and to think that they got down then, then they went up again and then again, like two, three, four times in a day. And then they do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. Like, there's no glamour in that. There's no knighthood in that. Like, it was tiring and I, I, it's, it's just exhausting. I can't, I can't believe how exhausting it was, even just for me, like for that one stupid little flight. So yeah, mm -hmm. it wasn't as glamorous. And, and yet that wasn't appreciated because everybody thought it was, was glamorous that they would be home in time for tea and all that kind of stuff. But I, yeah. I, I did research on one of my um, guys, the, the group that I research and he, um, uh, it, it, it didn't say so much in his records, but he was washed out basically with PTSD. Mm -hmm. yep. And he he wound up uh, in a convalescent home and they restricted his uh, light flying duties. And, and then he finally wound up back in Canada in a training role, which, is, which became the regular routine in the second war. But they didn't understand the stress of this glamorous pursuit. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I was thinking of as you were talking was the the early types, they had the smell, that castor oil that they used to lubricate the engines. And apparently that made quite a sickening smell as they were up there. Yeah, I, I can tell you from first-hand experience, I, can, I smelled the exhaust fumes um, for the entire flight as I put in yesterday. And it was, uh, you know, wasn't pleasant. The, um, what was gonna, oh, at one time, and also the fear. I mean, we talk about, you know, Knights of the Air and the Brave and all that. Well, I was flying a, in a metal glider one time and it's circling around and I heard this bang in the back somewhere. I don't know what it was and it scared the crap out of me. A bird? And I don't know what it was. You're like you get you hear about things being blown up in these thermals. Could have been a bird. I don't know. Um, so I kind of tested the controls, you know, making sure, you know, carefully. And then I, I landed and I looked back. There was nothing, no damage, but it was, it was a terrifying experience because, you know, I don't have, didn't have a parachute. And um, so when these guys had explosions going around them and bullets firing around, and man, it's these are young guys, PTSD, they're no kidding. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you could have gotten away without some kind of emotional uh, 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 happening. I was gonna mention, uh, uh, by the way, Garfield has become a member of our group. So we have a great resource that uh, another addition to our collection of great resources. So we're thrilled to have you as a member, Garfield. Hey, yeah, great. Yeah, it's, uh, glad to be here. Hey, by the uh, way, I'm, I'm plotting a scheme. Um, there's a, um, uh, I don't know how familiar everybody is with, with the aces in the air and all that, but there's a fellow named Andrew McKeever, yep. who has always claimed to be the highest ranking two-seater ace yep. for the Allies, okay? Was not. There's actually a guy named Ad, Alfred Atkey. Uh-oh. We just had an article on McKeever in a recent issue of the Maple Leaf. Yeah, <laughs> Atkey had... Um, I believe it was 38, McKeever at 31. Now, I'm just starting research about Alfred Atkey, and if anybody can help, great. Well, just Google him, and you'll see that uh, he actually outranks him. And I had found a story. I should have kept it. I don't know where I found it, but apparently he died on, on Carlton Avenue, Carlton Avenue, right in front of Maple Leaf Gardens, um, a homeless alcoholic right on the uh, street. And um, he, uh, he's, he's, he's cited but he has no fame whatsoever. He's got a grave site in Mississauga, a little stone um, that has his name. So I'm, uh, I'm hatching a scheme right now to um, do a flyover with the Great War Flying Museum um, with our soft with one and a half strutter and do a little formation flight over the grave site because it's just south of Brampton in Mississauga. So Alfred Atkey, look him up. Um, I'm looking- I'd love to do that, yeah. Did he fly uh, the F2B as well? Yes, he flew that. Yeah, I think he flew, started with the with the um, 
uh, DH4 and then went to the, but he had this epic flight, this epic fight, two against 20. It was, um, but his, the, the knowledge of him has kind of disappeared and I'm collecting information about him. I'd like to write a book about him, uh, but I certainly want to bring that up and, and just, and, you know, if, if I can keep in touch with you guys, if you're interested uh, in maybe providing a, a ground contingent um, at the gravesite on Memorial Day, on, um, on Remembrance Day, um, and we'll do an overflight with the smoke and the whole bit. Yeah. And, you know, I just think it's important that we recognize this, this fellow who is, who's really the top ranking to see. Well, there, there's a good article for the Maple Leaf, Garth. Well, we should, uh, we should get going on that. Do the, you know the, my, uh, the graves? The, what is the cemetery that he's buried in? Uh, I, I, sorry, I don't have the information for it, um, right, um, uh, at my fingertips, but it's, um, um, it's in Mississauga. So, right. Um, somebody's actually taking a picture you can go, again google them and find you can, a grave would my yeah, yeah. 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 that one yeah, how do you yeah I'll, I'll find out all Frank the coordinates Frank cemetery how do you spell his name uh alfred like uh alfred a l and then Ak is a t k e y it's a spring creek cemetery in mississauga okay and there's a little spring little stone it's, it's sad you know and i just wonder you know like you know we talk now we hear a lot about ptsd and all that and you know it's it's um uh, you know, he must it must have been awful for him you know like if, if that's true that he was you know became an alcoholic and died homeless like what a tragic story you know for um for this guy who really should be a hero they should have a statue of him but um again it's it's you can't blame people it's just simply ignorance you know it's just not knowing about this but he may have been sort of brushed aside a little bit because of that um un unpleasant life he had after. Um, on that note, I'm, I'm going to, uh, Garfield, I can't thank you enough for uh, speaking to us today. It's absolutely a fascinating topic. Um, thank you very much for, for sharing everything with us. It's, uh, it's a great, it's a totally new perspective on a topic. And uh, I salute you for, for the research you've done there. And uh, on behalf of our group, I, I can't thank you enough for, for speaking to us today.